an emergency closing? What 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 what, what will that look like in the future? Um, another uh, topic that we're going to talk about in July are all of our policies impacted by COVID and the recovery, right? So we did that last year. Um, this year, we're also adding the recovery piece to that, and that was specifically requested um, by the by the committee. In August, we are going to have our second uh, tier three discussion, which will be around uh, JBA, which is non-discrimination of students, ACA, non-discrimination, and JIC, bullying, harassment, or uh, intimidation of students. September, we're going to see the formal first reader of EBCD, uh, which we will have seen or uh, have brainstormed about in July. Uh, the same goes for October. We'll see the uh, formal first reader uh, policy committee version um, after having our discussion in August. So each each of those uh, you'll see that there are two months in between to have as much robust community engagement as possible in between when we have our initial discussion to when we make our preliminary recommendations. Um, in November, you'll see FFA, which is naming and renaming a, a school facility. There's been a tremendous amount of work uh, going on in the background of, um, you know, recommendations of and we brought this to policy committee last year talking just as a discussion piece about you know what what does a name mean and 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 looking at that um next and this was another one specifically brought up by the committee which is taking a look at uh, ika grading ikea promotion and retention and ikeb um, so this is a discussion right now it's not slated for coming back to policy committee that may may, may or may not change um, then in December, we have staff travel and reimbursements, which was on the original schedule for this year. But due to some equity concerns, uh, we decided to, to postpone it until this upcoming year. And then KDA access to public records, uh, HB 183 uh, requires updates on that. And at uh, the last board meeting or two board meetings ago, Ms. Duana Sturette gave a list of policies. Um, and th this, this is one of them that we're going to need to take a look at. So then moving on to January, uh, this was another request by uh, the committee to add a student government policy. We're going to take a look and see whether or not we could fit JJA student organizations in there or whether it needs to be a completely new policy. Another uh, topic that we're going to talk about, which was specifically requested for, was policies potentially impacted by Kerwin. So we're going to uh, really deep dive deep into that, led by Chief Seven. Um, next, uh, a fundraising policy. And we're going to revisit our KCD gifts and donations. Then another in March, we have another uh, uh, policy that's going to be up, uh, needs update required by HB 630, and that's our ADG sustainability. And then uh, we're going to provide an update on board rules. So for those of you that have been with us for a long time, uh, basically board rules were policies. We, we have been converting uh dozens of board rules into policies a year so we're going to provide an update on how many board rules are left and uh, things of that nature april we're going to see two o and i presentations um the ihbj public charter schools if you recall last year we had operator policy uh on the docket that was bumped we're going to roll those into this ihbj public charter school policy and uh, FCA closing of schools. May, we have a compensation policy from human capital as well as uh, ECAE school police and general order review. And lastly, in June, uh, a year from today around, give or take, EHB data retention. At the bottom, you'll see two additional uh, pieces of legislature that were passed that may or may not require us to uh, revisit uh policies that we currently have on record so we just passed a, a nursing students policy and uh, we also have kib uh, vol uh not volunteers sorry that's the wrong policy uh, we have we have a, a sex offender policy so uh, we need to see if those need to be updated so th that's uh it as far as the calendar goes um i have chief seven here and a few other chiefs here to answer questions if uh if you have them Great, thank you so much for that. Um, want to open up to our board members, um, uh, our committee members. Uh, do you all have any questions, thoughts, comments um, on what was shared? My only question uh, is, has this been run through PCAB or has PCAB seen this um, to weigh in? Yeah, so 
I sent I sent it to Christian to send to PCAP per per uh, community protocol. They need to get it like eight weeks in advance of it coming to you. So they got it well in advance of that. It has changed a little bit since then. But I, in the next presentation, which I will also be doing, I uh, when I presented that to PCAB, I also talked about the policy committee calendar. Um, so they have gotten the draft of this. Thank you. And have we solicited their um, feedback intentionally, or we just did we just send the draft and and ask for their input, or was there any follow up to ensure that you know because sometimes people just need the extra reminder or nudge, um, and especially for something as expansive as this policy calendar, I think that would be beneficial. Yeah. So the. They got a, like a three three week lead time, I want to say, in between when they got the policy and when I went to PCAB. So they had some time to to look it over. So when I was there to present the compliance report update, that was something that we talked about. And I think Christian has uh, last year, you know, was getting their feedback as well throughout the time. Like this should be updated so that their feedback was incorporated all along in the creation of the calendar. So that's why I think we didn't see really any suggestions or feedback from them is because all along the process, you know, we were writing things down, whether it was something that they suggested we should take a look at. With the thank you for that, Joe, with the um, January with the student government uh, policy and potentially the JJA. Um, is that going to be a discussion or will that be like a draft? It, it, it's scheduled right now to be a draft. If you feel that that's something that should be bumped up from a tier two, which is our standard policy to a tier three, we could definitely think about um, having that maybe in October or you know December adding it to the policy committee as a discussion piece but I will leave that to the to you all yeah Dr Brooks Commissioner Brooks I think we should consider um having an opportunity for our young people in the community to weigh in on a policy like this of student government since we've heard a lot of input from our students over the past several months about it. Um, I think it may be beneficial for us to engage a little differently around that to really have them at the center of, as they should be with all of, of what we do, but with this particularly, um, I, th I think that should be something that we consider. Yeah, Christian, did you have a, a response to that? Did you want to chime in? Just, yeah, just a point to chime in too, potential idea. Um, perhaps I know you all, uh, I'm still taking a look at it, want to consider, sorry, my camera's off, I don't know, talking without my camera off, um, consider like multiple board forums throughout the school year. So perhaps this could be incorporated into one in like January or February as part of like that discussion. So just offering that as a, you know, a way of additional engagement on this policy. Mm -hmm. I think I thank you for that question. I think to Joe's point, it may need to come a little earlier than that if we're looking at this as a potential draft for January. Um, so maybe some sort of fall forum or uh, like that. I really think the session that we did, that student, that youth forum that we did in March, the format of that was great. And if we could do something like that similar, similarly to that for this, I think it would be helpful. Not just for the board to gain input, but for the young people to, number one, take ownership of a policy like this um, and to really um, provide some relevant input in, into, the, into the draft. So just so I'm understood, um, you're saying the board form in the fall, but we can, the, are you saying the board form in the fall and then a pre-discussion on this or keep it in January and just have the board form leading up to this in January? Yes, that, the latter. Okay, so keep it in January, but a board form before it. Got it. Um, and then my final thing, Dr. Brooks, is for the presentations, Joe, that, that come up for all of the policy, as we are um, rolling out um, new strategic priorities, um, and we're developing key performance indicators. It would be lovely if we could see um, how each of these policies that are being placed on the agenda directly relate to one of those board priorities. And if we could link the KPIs as appropriate. 
if if that ask is making sense especially for commissioners that will be joining they will be joining after we've adopted this this calendar but the community certainly has provided input on the strategic priorities and we're developing the kpis so i think to keep us aligned strategically if these presentations around the policies could align to or highlight one of the strategic priorities that it directly uh, corresponds with i think that would be very helpful not just for the board but also the sake of accountability with our community i think that would be beneficial yeah thank you for that i think uh just speaking across the the committees i think we're going to try to do that for everything so teaching and learning operations and policy committee as well as full board presentation so We'll absolutely uh, try and make sure to make that a point for each of our policy presentations. The record's not broken. I just wanted to reiterate that uh, for, for everything that we see moving forward. Thank you, though. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brooks. Thank you. And I do, uh, I agree with uh, um, uh, having the more engagement with our young people on the on the front end um, to give them some uh, some capacity to, to help shape and inform what this really needs to look like and if it is actually the thing that they're actually requesting. And so there might be, I can imagine that there might be some flowering of uh, this initial idea, but through the conversations that there might be other areas where we might need to revisit policies uh, that uh, might need to be shifted or changed it to be more focused on young people uh, as well. So, uh, so I, I'm in agreement there. Um, um, I think, you know, um, uh, from my perspective, my question was really around uh, if um, uh, if other commissioners felt like uh, the suggestions that we've offered uh, were incorporated into the calendar in a way that um, held the balance between some of our board level um, sort of uh, ideas around sort of what we need to move forward, as well as sort of some of the uh, the the chief's uh, ideas and and so forth. And so, I uh, just wanted to offer that as an opportunity for some discussion if we need it. Um, I, I think, um, Dr. Brooks, that uh, hearing the next presentation around the compliance reports, I think will uh, help to make a little bit more sense of the what you're asking specifically right now. I would like to see how they marry bef before I'm able to weigh in on that because I know that we've had quite a bit of conversation around the compliance reports and um, how we how 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 much we appreciate them mm -hmm. um, and where they fall so um, I, I would be eager to hear that first before I respond to that question that you just posed sweet great but another idea came to mind, Dr. Brooks, um, as you mentioned, getting the students' input. Um, if Christian, all of our the forms that we have, if we're going to, if we're considering putting them in that um, youth form style somehow, um, to perhaps upcoming policies that are on the calendar, whether they're drafts, if we could have a session where our students are able to engage with those policies um, because I know that we're thinking about having forms quarterly. So if if we're thinking of that, if we could highlight some of the policies that are coming up for draft and perhaps have a session dedicated to that just for our students, for them to weigh in um, and to have discussion around that, I think that may be uh, beneficial to the board as well. Yeah, and that's helpful because I was actually in the process trying to check out Jessica's notes and kind of sketch out and interpret what you all said for the committee chairs meeting. So that is helpful for my work. And it's just kind of leaving it blank depending on like the basically needs at the moment, right? Because obviously if something consequential pops up, you want to talk about like a current event or something like that. So that that's helpful. And in addition to, I just want to also name, you know, we're still going to continue with the board hearings like Comar legislative and then just have the, the forums be uh, youth forum style. Great, Dr. James. Um, so around the compliance reports, 
um, just a couple of pieces. Wondering, um, Christian, if it would be possible to triage the policy compliance reports similar to how we triage the policies for what has federal implications, what has state and local implications or funding connected to them. Uh, and then further, if there's a way to to identify those on the website so that when we hear the compliance reports, if there are folks that have been impacted by that by that policy, either positively or negatively, they know, oh, this is when the board will do a deep dive into the compliance of this policy. So this is when I should attend the policy meeting to share my perspective on what was challenging about how the policy was written or what what makes it a great policy to support my work or my student experience or my community partner experience um, on, on the implementation end so that we can have a better understanding of how we can support regs and policy changes to really meet the needs of the community. And I don't know how that's possible, but I think it would be it would be amazing, you know, it, as we get our compliance report, if we also had testimony like I engaged with this policy and it really helped protect me or I engaged with it, it sort of helped, but this is how it could have helped more. Um, some of those I, pieces. I, I think yeah, I think the first suggestion would that would definitely have to work very closely with staff on that. Um, but to the second piece, I mean, we we do, and I know this is not enough, so I don't want to say this enough. We do post the cap. The calendar is always available on the website, so it is in available for the public to know what's coming up. And especially with the compliance reports being public, that'll also uh, you know be relevant. Um, but I also think it's just thinking through maybe communication of how to how do you you know how do you reach somebody because obviously the average person had the time to like you know check this and say oh this is coming up so you know perhaps it's a further discussion of um, targeted outreach to you know groups that might be affected or uh, might want to speak on the compliance report. Which what I'm trying to get at even more specifically than that, but that that's a great flag. It's more like a customer service follow up survey. You know, would you want to work with this person again? So someone calls the board office and wants to talk about policy X, Y, Z. After they have that interaction, is there a way to do a follow up with them that says, you know, were you satisfied? Was the did the policy meet your needs? Did you get what you needed? And as a flag, this policy will be up for a compliance report on June 15th at the policy meeting. You know, something that if it could be sort of an automated customer service follow up piece to help capture more robust information, mm -hmm. um, both to find the warts as well as to find the roses. Right. OK, I see what you're saying. And I mean, we, we don't get too much engagement on on that level, but we can try to think of creative ways to try to you know, do that, really do that follow up and just try to solicit uh, useful feedback on the compliance, the public compliance reports. Yeah, and I, I, I think for me, what I would add is that like I hear like in sort of Dr. James, what you were saying, like I, I feel like um, that level of work around sort of one, I think there's a whole body of work with, around what it means to bring a compliance report into the public eye. Um, I think, um, one, I think that's both a communication aspect of that, because how do we communicate to sort of people that, one, this thing is happening, which is new, but then two, um, that those are also opportunities for them to do exactly what you're saying, to sort of think about how it's impacted them and sort of that piece. And so, so, so I think that's true. And then my, but then also I'm sitting here thinking about the strategic planning and that that also should be a part of our strategic goals around sort of how do we bring about transparency in the district? Um, because essentially that's what it's about. Uh, it's about sort of how do we as a, as a policy committee or a group of folks um, ensure that sort of the policies that we actually create are uh, actually doing what they're supposed to be doing in the first place. Um, and I think that needs to be an accountability measure that is at the highest level and that is a full board um, uh, sort of uh, expectation. And I think it should be aligned with our strategic goals and um, priorities. Um, and so um, I just wonder if there's additional conversation that we might need to have um, with the board uh, about what that really means before we ask the staff to do a thing with it um, uh, at, at this particular moment. Um, both holding that I know that's something that we want to get to, but sitting here as a strategic on the, the strategic planning committee, like that should be something that we should be tussling with uh, uh, immediately. Um, and and 
uh, before we ask for staff time to do a thing. That's just my thoughts and would open to thoughts and feedback and you know, pushback of all that sort of thing as well. Yeah, no, I don't have any pushback, but I just I feel like it's it's such a tricky lane to stay in in governance and not management when it comes to compliance reports, um, much like the regulations. Um, when we get the compliance reports, though, and to make them more meaningful than a box checking of compliance, it mm -hmm. I think that the ability to then really leverage those compliance reports to update, to adjust and modify the policies as lived documents, hearing from people who have been impacted by them gives us a better sense of, of the ability to govern over the policy implementation without stepping into management and getting out of our lane. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Christian. I would just add to, I mean, I, I think we need to probably think bigger too and not bigger but in a broader sense um you know the average person in a school right probably doesn't think oh this is policy a b a b c right it's just like boss is being mean to me or something um so I, you know i would also try to you know consider like you know public comment just general public comment because that tells a story right of what's going on in schools and then thinking about how that connects to the compliance report work and you know can you come talk about that. So just thinking about, I think, the whole body of feedback that you all receive, how does that kind of inform compliance reports and how things are working, et cetera? Yeah, um, and I see a hand. I don't know, is that a, uh, oh, okay, Allison. That is me. Um, thanks. So I think this conversation is really helpful. And I think as we're um, so we did, to Commissioner McFadden's uh, point, there is a report coming on the compliance reports themselves and, and what changes we made. I would say that's still a work in progress, and I feel like part of the work, you know, we did that um, in partnership with, uh, with the board staff, and we need to keep doing that as we're developing and refining policies, because I think partly at getting, getting at those critical questions and finding that middle um, lane that um, Dr. Uh, James is talking about of like between, you know, really making that a living, breathing um, policy that has implications and not getting too much into management. I think part of that gets into the how do you framing what you need in terms of compliance in a strategic way when the policy is written and not uh, and avoiding laundry list stuff. Because I think one challenge is that we have so many compliance reports that to for for staff to use in a strategic way is tough because there are so many of them. And so just the vo the sheer volume of them, it's hard to make those meaningful full documents and so we did a little bit of trying to uh, you know to um to be more strategic and aligning some of them in this cut but i think as we develop policies and certainly as we create new policies we need to just continually have a focus be what are the key most strategic pieces of information we know to get at that piece that you're all trying to get at is how do you make this a living breathing compliance report that's actually really delivering what we envision for this policy as opposed to a laundry list of everything we ever wanted to know in this area because I, you know, or or just too just so broad of just you know factual information that's actually not going to move the needle, um, because it is again, there is just a capacity issue in terms of really being able to make those useful reports given the volume of them and the and requirements of them right now. So just all of us together can keeping focusing on that as we uh, review policies to think about are these really the key levers we would want to know that are really going to move the the needle um, uh, when we when we do this and have we really called it back to the key levers and not just all the pieces we might want to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you for that, Allison. Um, I feel like there's a, um, uh, I think we can get at some of that around sort of how we begin to um, uh, template out sort of what the compliance reports um, really need and what we need from them. And so as we structure them, um, as we have some conversation about that, I think that might be a really great way to get at exactly what you're talking about, which is like, what are the highest level, highest priority things that can really make that? And I think if we can collectively, as you said, continue to do that. I think we can get at that. Um, so thank you for that. And I also, you know, um, um, uh, want to, you know, when I think about Dr. Uh, James's point around, like when I see our, um, 
our, our bullying and harassment policy, um, I know for a fact that it is it would be a such powerful testimony to to hear young people talking about uh, its effectiveness um, on their lives and and I think um, how we get there. So I want like so for me, I know that that's where I would love to be able to do, um, but I also know that there there's so much legwork to get um, folks prepared to know what to do in those spaces uh, when we even struggle to get people to come and do public, our young, particularly our young people to come and give public testimony. Um, and so I think there's some capacity building um, on their end uh, with the support of the district to help, you know, get ready to be in that space. But, but yeah. Um, but it also could be like in that to your point on that, because I agree that kind of feedback is helpful. And so um, partly I think Christian's right is that when people come to speak, what are we delineating from that? But also being strategic, and I think this is true to the compliance reports themselves, but also maybe to the feedback on those reports is are there certain times, is certain um, certain cadence at which we're drilling a little deeper? So maybe you you know every couple of years you get engagement, or every third year you you do a more robust engagement on a policy, and maybe you plan that out a little bit. So you're so this is the year we're going to go a little deeper in the bullying policy to get a, a deeper sense of what it is. Um, just because it's hard to do that every year for all policies. So maybe if the board thinks a little bit about what are the what's the cadence at which you would want it you know, hear from stakeholders and really go a little bit deeper in some key policies. Um, maybe we can plan that out a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts from our um, commissioners before we move on to the next presentation? Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate it um, for the work on the calendar and, and really bringing in our feedback um, uh, that you've uh, so wonderfully incorporated. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. And uh, I'm also doing the compliance report presentation. So this last little bit has been a really great segue for that. Um, so let, let me pull that up really quick and uh, we can get into that. All right, so I'm going to hop back for just one second. So the reason why everyone was talking about compliance reports during the last presentation was because, as you'll see on the calendar here, we have all the compliance reports listed, right? So that's that's something that's totally new for this year. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief presentation kind of uh, about what we're thinking uh, moving forward. So we will be making all compliance reports public starting july 1 so so basically instead of them going to the board um they will be made available to the public as part of policy committee so as you'll see on the calendar some months have a lot some months don't have a lot so really you know once we submit the reports uh, all chiefs and authors of the compliance reports will be invited to policy committee so if there are questions that the the committee has if there are questions that the public have um we, we will have representation there, hopefully, to be able to discuss in further detail. I'm not I'm assuming that not all compliance reports will have discussion or questions, but um, you know, so obviously some will. So basically, there are four things that we're looking at here, right? So one, we're, we as Allison stated, we have so many compliance reports, right? So in sometimes they're reports that we submit in other places and some parts they're really uh, they're really not helpful um, which we'll outline in this presentation so one we want to remove some of the uh, compliance report requirements of some of our policies another one you'll see later on in the presentation we we're, we're recommending to merge some reports right so instead of getting a report you know in september and then it's like report in november and it's like report in may we're going to have them all be submitted at the same time under one report so that people it's much like all a lot of these changes we're really trying to increase transparency and usefulness of these compliance reports right so we don't want people to have to look around for uh compliance reports that make sense uh to all be packaged together so we're just going to be packaging them together um then the, the next two were kind of uh just more um you know 
tidying up uh, recommendations. So we we just uh, within the last few years we added Chief High Cupboard and her department, um, uh, the community engagement um, office. So and enrollment. Um, so a lot of the policies that were listed under the CAO or the Chief of Schools are now going to be going to her. So th this is a way for us to um, get the correct uh, the current org chart you know, uh, under the responsible chief. And then the next one, a lot of our policies didn't have due dates or they didn't have, um, you know, specific times of when they should be submitted or um, they were due dates that did not make sense with the way that the, the MSDE or, um, you know, city council budget Terry uh, things uh, it did they didn't make sense anymore so we're, we're recommending to change the dates once again we want we want to add a due date so there's accountability of this it's due at this exact date so then that the the public can expect it to be presented or submitted at that date right because if there's no due date then oftentimes it, it keeps getting pushed keeps getting pushed keeps getting pushed so that's another way that we're hope, hoping to be more useful to the public and to the staff and to the board as I said, two big reasons behind all of this work, increasing transparency and improving the utilization of the reports. As Allison and the committee said, like, you know, we're getting these reports. They might as well not just be a check the box exercise, but we should be using them as a way to determine whether our policies are working, what can be changed, what can be updated, um, and really using them to help drive the work rather than just checking the box um, that we submitted a report. So the next few slides you're going to see um, the our policies in alphabetical order and the recommended changes. These all the changes fall within those four buckets that I previously mentioned. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of them, um, but as you'll see, we're, we are recommending a lot of policy changes and these are policy changes. So uh, with these they will need to be approved by the board and the policies will need to be updated accordingly um okay so as far as engagement goes um really did not get much feedback the, when i presented to pcab uh, it was really a really great uh, meeting where everyone was really just excited that the these compliance reports were going to be made public i do want to say uh, as a caveat that there may be times if it's a personnel or legal issue that um, the compliance reports will have redacted information and confidential memo will be submitted to the board exclusively that will not be used for things to try and hide information from the public that will be because uh, you know personnel and legal matters so for example uh, gbeh is our legal uh, policy where literally you know that lists all of our current uh, pending litigation so that ha that's information that will uh, most likely just go to the board whereas the public might see you know a, a tally of how many um, you know pieces of litigation we have going or you know what types of litigation but there will be some pieces that will not be uh, made publicly available so that, that that's that's all that I have. Uh, I and then in the appendix, I, I have you know what the current compliance looks like for all of our policies. So you can see kind of what what's going to be what the recommendations for change are. Um, so that's that's about it. Great, thank you so much for that, um, committee members. Um, Dr. James. Oh, you're frozen, Dr. James. Let me try undoing my photo. Does that help? Yes. Yeah, I, I know. OK, perfect. Um, I was like, I'm not frozen over here, though. <laughs> so uh, so Joe, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, the clustering not only does it make intuitive sense, but it helps with our, you know, our client service aspect of our, our work. Uh, and it was no easy task. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, when we talk about triaging, though, just also to point out in those in those um, compliance reports that some of them are federally required and and do have financial and legal implications um, 
so just really highlighting that for people. But then the last piece that I, I want to offer is, is when we do, especially for the first few years, and this is about, you know, admitting where we are and understanding that we're, we're modeling a growth mindset for the community. Yeah, if we can be sure to include the, you know, the last two, three years or the last two, three cycles of compliance reports um, as, a, as a tool to help understand how we're growing in the information that we're sharing. Um, you know, many, many compliance reports, and this has been part of my push for this over the last few years, would come and it would be, you know, we submitted a compliance report and that's the bulk of the information is just that we submitted one and every year being told, well, next year it will have robust information next year. So that people can really see that this is the way we're trying to use this information and not just have it be something extra for staff to do, but to really communicate the, the growth in understanding policy and applying policy uniformly across the board. So I, I hear you. Um, the the one concern that I have with that is the reports that were submitted in previous years were meant exclusively for the board. So, just um, the the language used, the uh, lack of redacted information. I feel like moving forward, the audience will be different. So it'll be a lot less inside baseball. Um, it'll be meant for public consumption. So I am a little bit nervous about going to the chiefs and saying, OK, everything you submitted to the board as a private memo is now going to be made public. Um, we could definitely try and look at some of the data that was provided and include that in the report as like trend data. But I don't necessarily think that we would uh, recommend making things public that were private. Absolutely, and that's not that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, what I what I'm really speaking to is the quantity, the vast majority of compliance reports we received had no no re necessarily redactable information on. They were they were really um, obviously we don't we don't want to share anything that would violate anyone's privacy um, or any confidentiality pieces. But there is a need to be far more transparent. Right. But so I, I mean, I agree with Joe that I think, you know, maybe sharing some of the data trends would make sense. But going back to um, go through all the compliance reports over several years to identify what could be uh, shared and not, I, I think we're changing the policy going forward to make them public. And like I said, I'm, I think maybe looking at some trends of data that would show key key um, the kind of information you're indicating that you want to see is like what is the um, the change over time but um, going back to old reports is not something that I think uh, would be very easy to take on. And Christian did you want to jump in? Oh just a reminder for the committee uh, the board office we did post for your benefit in the library the last two years of compliance report so you all do have access to that information in a one easy place. So just a reminder. Yeah, thank you for that, Christian. Um, and, um, you know, I. Um, one of the things that feels really um, one important, which is a huge milestone, is to get this information uh, public um, and, you know, hope that it will inspire our community members to really weigh in and, and think about how we begin to approach this, um, the work. Um, uh, and at the same time, um, I honestly can say, I don't know if it's the best use of staff's time to go back to all those years of compliance reports and try to sort of then sort of kind of redact or to do that. Trends, I think feels like really like appropriate and like, like would be helpful to know as, as, uh, for example, when I again, I, the bullying harassment data is always stuck in my head. So like, I would I would be nice to be able to see that over the several years and see if how we've gone up or gone down. Um, uh, but there are there, are, uh, you know, I, I just want to, yeah, I honor the ask and to like, like again, I, without the, I would say if without the level of clarity that we've talked about earlier around what do we really need um, from people. Uh, then to have people kind of just going and doing stuff without us having a maybe a preset meeting to actually scope out what we really want, it probably would be um, not the most useful, uh, more efficient uh, for people's time. Uh, but Dr. James, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not asking for any additional work. I'm 
the preponderance of compliance reports we've gotten really have no information in them or very little. So it's not, and there's very few that have identifying information. I'm just saying where appropriate, put up historical documents. That's, I'm, I'm not asking for additional work. I'm not asking, um, I'm, and, and again, I won't be on the committee for much longer. Um, so I'm just merely suggesting for the committee members to keep in mind um, really that we need we need to make sure that we're getting quality information and make sure we're getting a lot and that's not that anybody's been trying to deceive us um it's just that the practice of compliance reports for so long was much more of a i have to give this piece of paper in to say we've done it rather than using this as a tool for continuous improvement yeah so and but again even going through them to identify the ones that work i think is is a challenge and I again I will say that I think the the volume of compliance reports is related very much to what you're talking about in terms of the in depth the level to which they're in depth I think at this point we have 80 compliance reports or so um, and many times those are coming out of the same department so if you're doing five reports a month um, or more and you're from one department it, you are going to get a cursory level of information so I'm just pushing again that the board needs to be strategic about what information they do want and where they want us to go deep because you can't go deep in 80 areas in a year. You're just not going to. So you're right. not going to see in-depth reports if that's if that's the volume. They're not going to get in-depth reports. So. Right. And it's to circle back then to my original statement that can we triage the compliance reports similar to how we we rank the policies themselves. Yeah, and I think that makes sense. Yeah. So I just like yeah. So that makes sense going forward mm -hmm. commissioner mcfadden do you want to weigh in um yeah i think moving forward it's i think that's the way to go but i also want to encourage this committee our committee when we see compliance reports um to christian's point we do have the last two years of compliance reports there. I think it is our responsibility to ensure that the rest of the board is able to juxtapose those with the reports that we're going to receive moving forward for the sake of perspective. But definitely, I agree with everything that everyone was saying. Um, do, does, Joe, does the, the calendar, the draft calendar reflect the recommendations that are outlined in this compliance report presentation? Yes, it does. Um, it, so like you'll see new dates are on uh, on the policy committee calendar. The ones that are removed are on the on that calendar. So they're the presentations that I did one and two are partnered together. So if if I'm going, uh, hopefully I will be bringing this uh, in July 24th to the full board. I'm going to request a waiver so that um, it could be voted on at the next board meeting. Um, so this way, you know, everything I would have liked to have done it by July 1st, so everything would be nice and neat. But we are going to make the ones in July public, even if you know, at the end of July, we just the board decides, you know, that they're not going to approve this and that it needs to go to a second reader. Um, but yeah, the, the policy committee calendar is reflecting upon the recommendations and the presentation that I uh, just gave. OK, so help me. So the reason why I ask, for example, if we're looking at. Um, if we're looking at, let's say. Because I just saw it, if we look at ADA, right, the equity policy and the recommended change is to add in a due date of August 31st, I don't see that in the draft calendar so am i looking at it in, incorrectly or are you going to make those recommendations for the full board to see in, at the july meeting so the date is this august august 30th i think is that the is that uh so if you look at the september 21st board meet uh public uh, policy committee meeting ada equity is there gotcha 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 okay so they're like so, months Exactly. Right. So I yeah, so it. it will always be the first policy committee meeting after the due date. I got it. So that makes sense. That was helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I think um, again, you know, uh, I know this was no uh, small task uh, to, to pull these pieces together and 
just kind of want to say, you know, a, a deep level of gratitude uh, there. Um, and I would also like to add, like, for me, um, uh, as we're considering, like, you know, uh, both the um, the conversions from um, uh, rules into policies uh, and so forth that we're just, again, uh, trying to pay attention to how do we make sure that we're not just re reproducing work and also I'm I'm just not interested in having more policy for policy's sake. Um, I, I'm really interested in sort of what we have, making it deeper, richer, more useful and effective. Um, and so like, uh, I, I just kind of want to name that as like, as we move this, this body of work forward, like we're open to recommend it, like this is like, what if we did it this way that would give you the type of information um, instead of having to recreate a whole nother thing. So I think that as a like, just want to say, like, there's some flexibility and creativity there, because um, I just, I just have not, I have not seen just the presence of policy as an indicator of, uh, per se, the quality of of the experience on our children, um, our young people experiencing school. So at the end of the day, whatever we can do to make our policy sharper, but more importantly, to have them be more effective, is sort of what, uh, sort of my energy is around uh, this body of work. Commissioner McFadden. I just want to chime in to completely agree with you, Dr. Brooks. I don't think that we need to, when it's appropriate, for example, the student government, right? You're, you're looking at JJA or what, whatever um, policy that could align, align to that. I think to Dr. Brooks's point, we don't always have to create new policy. We can just cross-reference some that already exist to Dr. Brooks's point in making them sharper. But I just want, I want to reiterate, I want to back up the chair in, in saying that because this process can become very exha exhaustive um, and then ultimately meaningless because there are so many that no one can keep track of it all, right? So um, I think it's critically important um, to, I'm following the direction of our chair here, they they should be sharper, not necessarily more, because we're looking for quality, right, instead of the, the quantity. And I also love, Dr. Brooks, how you just mentioned, how do the policies directly relate to student outcomes? Because all of our policies should, in some way, um, and the work that everyone does in this school system should directly relate to that. Um, and I think having policies that illuminate that will allow folks to take more ownership in that no matter where you work, right, in city schools, all of our responsibility is to take care of our children. So I just wanted to reiterate our chair there. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Joe, for uh, all of the hard work and Allison for you weighing in on that too. And uh, Christian, um, I know it's been a huge lift. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, we will pass it over to our next um, uh, policy to review policy DGA uh, procurement for that presentation. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. My name is Jessica Wilson. I'm the executive director of strategic resourcing and financial management and currently the acting director of procurement. So uh, today we're bringing uh, fo forward the updates to the DGA procurement policy as long as just uh, with updates to some of the things that we're working on and thinking about as it relates to the practice and implementation of the current policy. So if you could go to the next slide. So the procurement regulations and policy were updated in 2019. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do as part of the process of updating the policy and regulations was really taking a, a look at and reviewing those practices and the implementation to identify areas um, that for improvement of how the current policy was being implemented, how it was being experienced by end users. And we really did that by um, going through an engagement process that where we were trying to hear from students, parents, and staff about what it, procurement uh, should be focusing on, what's the most important thing for from a priority standpoint, uh, receive that feedback from those end users as well as students and, and families on the procurement process itself, uh, and then uh, receive feedback from vendors um, and how they have been experiencing both the procurement process as well as some of the other kind of nuts and bolts processes of actually doing business here at City Schools through the procurement team. So next slide, please. 
So we identified uh, a gr groups for listening sessions. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we hit uh, a sample of both internal stakeholders, offices. We talked to principals, both from charter schools and traditional schools and from a various grade bands. And we also wanted to reach out and talk to some of uh, the PCAB, CCAC, and the student group as well. Um, and so the listening sessions for the internal groups, the, the end users here at city schools, the offices and the schools um, were kind of where mostly where we started in order to sit down and go through some questions that would provide some immediate feedback for that procurement process. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, we really wanted to focus in on uh, 10 questions. These were guiding questions for that listening session. In some of the sessions, we got through all 10. In others, it led to conversations where maybe we didn't touch on absolutely everything. But you can see from the questions, it was really focusing in on the experience of the procurement po practice and policy, um, as well as getting some feedback on the policy and regulation itself. Um, getting uh, some ideas about the people in the room and like how how familiar they are with um, what, how, what procurement does, the, the actual processes themselves. And we ask questions, just, you know, general questions. How can the procurement department better support your work? Um, the procurement time timelines we often hear are longer than anticipated. What are some tools, information, or the communications that we can provide as the procurement team that might help you navigate some of that procurement timeline? Um, we also ask things like, um, what the priority for the procurement office should be, what should be the focus of a strategic plan for the department. Um, and, and then we also ask the general question, you know, if you're familiar with the policy and the regulations, what are some things you would like to see change that were, um, you know, that were related to specific things in the policy or regs? Um, so next slide, please. There were some key themes that we heard across the board, whether it was an office that was in, in a listening session or principals or other staff. Um, one was just the need to improve reporting and assess kind of an access to that basic information reports that have things like contract end dates and the remaining renewals for different types of, of uh, contracts, the ability to look up how much they've spent and, and, and where they've spent those things and searchable options to review vendors with board approved contracts. These are all things that kind of are available in different places across the district and across our systems, but there wasn't a user friendly place for um, offices or schools to, to plug into that. So that, yes, there may be an Excel sheet that's available on the website, but it doesn't have all the information you might be looking for. And yes, you might be able to go and look up things in, in, in um, our systems in Oracle or K-12 by, uh, which are systems that we use to actually process things, but there wasn't kind of a user-friendly single report that was available. So oftentimes that means that they have to rely on requesting items from the procurement team themselves that are also juggling and dealing with lots of other things, including solicitations and approving requisitions. And so the time lag on some of that access to information was something that people were concerned about. Um, watching the contracts move through the process. So that we have this very uh, public part of the process where we do the solicitation, we ask for those uh, responses, we review them, there's a board letter and there's board approval, but there's also kind of the behind the scenes part of that where we have a contract that runs in parallel with that board approval. And offices are really struggling with the ability to see exactly where that contract was in the process. Are we still negotiating with a vendor? Is it waiting for review? Is it in a signature queue? Um, this is, again, something that you can ask to have a status for, but it isn't something that an end user can go and get right now. There was also a lot of um, interest in additional training documents or uh, uh, things that make people more aware of resources that are already available. So there is an intranet site right now that has a wide variety of procurement resources. Many people were unaware that that was available to them. So we're working on so both new training materials that are requested as well as uh, lifting up where you go to find different uh, resources that were already available. Process takes too long. Uh, that one came up pretty much everywhere we talked to folks. Um, and that is partly just how it works in, in public uh, procurement process and also um, partly a, an indication of capacity of individual staff to review some of the materials that we get uh, and that we receive um, and some other kind of um, uh, kind of choke points that exist within the timeline. So if you miss, uh, for instance, the submission of a board letter, you do have to wait for the next committee and the next 
um, board, public board meeting to be approved and they, they happen, you know, one a month for committees and every other week for public board meetings. So there's some things that are our process can we can work better on communication and helping um, offices plan and there are some things that are kind of how the calendar works uh, when you're working through that approval process. Um, Improving invoicing and payment processes was another one that was uh, that was lifted up as, as needing some support. This one we're, is uh, something we also heard about from some of our vendors as well. So this happens on both sides. And so we're looking at, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things we're gonna do to help with that. And then uh, more information provided to end users for requisitions that are placed on hold within the system. So right now we have a system where you might ask to buy something it makes its way through the approval queue and it gets to the procurement department and then one of the buyers has to place it on hold because there is a question or a missing piece of information or there's just something that doesn't allow them to kind of review and approve it immediately. Um, this is one that we, we um, the system does allow us to provide notes in those situations. And so one of the things that we're already doing is making sure that as we're placing those items on hold, we're, we're being um, diligent about placing the notes in the system so that end users can see um, why something has been placed on hold. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, we did have uh, positive things that came out of these listening sessions of, as well. Um, many of the uh, departments or schools and principals that we talked to has talked about the high level of customer service that buyers really do try and be as responsive as they can be given the portfolio they're working on, that our buyers are knowledgeable. They understand their the areas in which that they they do their work. They know the vendors. They understand the industry in general, and so they're able to help people navigate that process. They're responsive, cooperative, professional, and patient. And one of my favorites was that end users do not feel judged for not knowing the process. So we're we're constantly working with it, um, all of our. Um, stakeholders across the district trying to help them both navigate this process, possibly for the first time, possibly for the 10th time, but really it's about teaching them how they can better um, plug into the procurement process in a way that allows them to be as effective as they can be in their in their work. Uh, next slide, please. So we also did parent and student stakeholder listening sessions. This was with PCAB, CCAC, and um, the student government. Here we really we gave kind of a procurement 101 gave kind of the high level overview of what different types of procurements there are in the district, um, uh, some basic information about how procurements work, uh, because we didn't want to start from a place of assuming that everyone had kind of read the regulations and the policy and things like that. Um, we also had an additional session with the PCAB members kind of earlier in the process where they gave a lot of um, good feedback and, and kind of thoughts around what they thought would be a great way for us to be able to better consolidate and provide uh, access to information for families and community members outside the district. So what we asked really kind of three questions in these listening sessions and then had a conversation. Um, what is the most important thing for school systems to consider when buying materials for students and why? Um, what, how can we support all students better with how we purchase materials and services for the district? And what types of information would be helpful for parents, community members um, on how, this, how the district actually does that process of purchasing services and materials for students? Um, just want to highlight a couple of the um, All of the groups uh, that we talked to about this, uh, parents and students said durability, efficiency, quality, and value were up there. Um, and that we need to be considering the needs of all students when we're selecting uh, items for purchase. Um, the, the students had a really interesting uh, kind of caveat to that or a different way of thinking about it. One of the things that they said is we should be looking around at other jurisdictions and seeing what they're buying um, because Baltimore City students should be getting this at least as, as good as other successful districts across the state. And so I thought that was really interesting that they were particularly interested in that comparison piece and making sure that we procurement were, were working on that, that kind of benchmarking to make sure that we were comparable in what we were purchasing uh, to other districts around the, around the state. Um, the other thing that the students really lifted up is that sometimes they don't know what they need, but their teachers know what they need. And so that it's really important that we're gonna be incorporating teacher voice into the procurement process because teachers are able to speak up on behalf of students uh, when they're going through that process. And that's something that's already, we're accelerating the, the participation of teachers across the board in procurement. Our teaching and learning department has 
you know, routinely brought in teachers as part of the review panels for different types of purchases, and we're continuing to do that. I thought it was really interesting that it was that was something that was specifically named by students as an important part of the process. Um, the other thing that the students uh, were were interested in and thought it would be a, a kind of, but they weren't exactly sure how it would work or exactly sure how to phrase it, but they definitely were interested in us surveying students for kind of the performance of vendors in particular when we're thinking about uh, procurements. And so one of the things that we're going to be working on is kind of a longer term project and figuring out how to do that as part of the contract monitoring piece of it is um, how would we set up a structure in which we could actually get some student feedback that would be available for the procurement department and departments within the district that are responsible for those contracts so that we know kind of the on the ground feel from the students as well. Uh, we also heard a lot about delivery of materials in a timely fashion. I will say I think that that one is somewhat related to the time period that we were all experiencing when we were going through this process. Supply chains have been very um, strained over the last year and a half. And so one of the things that people had definitely noticed about procurement in general was that that issue of timely delivery. And so that's something that we have been monitoring across the board for different types of contracts. We'll continue to do so, but I do think that that one in particular was, um, you know, recent experience more so than a, a systemic problem that we see when things are up and running and supply chains are working like they should. Uh, the last thing I'll raise up from this, and this um, was a fantastic call out from one of the parent groups, is that parents need help understanding why procurement is important. They don't want us using jargon. The word procurement doesn't speak to anyone when we're thinking about it, when we're trying to get feedback or when we're going out there and talking with people. So really thinking about how we can do a better job of uh, breaking down what it is that that procurement means, what why it's important, um, and how parents and, and and the community can kind of pay attention to what is happening as far as that purchasing piece uh, for the district. Um, and so that's one again that we're going to be uh, working on uh, moving forward as far as making things available uh, and and bringing together places and, and single sources of information that will allow the district to better communicate both with internal staff and um, ex you know families and community members as well. Um, next slide. Uh, so the last kind of group of stakeholders we talked to were, were the vendors, and we did this with a survey. So we um, took vendors from FY20, and we wanted to survey top, middle, and lowest revenue vendors. So we wanted to do to get information from people we do big business with as far as dollar value and small dollar value business. We wanted to do it across different types of categories, and we wanted to make sure that we were also including WMBE um, vendors within the sample that we went out for. So we used about 5% of the 2,000 plus vendors that were uh, were selected, uh, and we asked them several questions. Um, can you go to the next slide? So we had a response rate of 35%. 26% of the respondents were MWBE certified. 92% um, of them said, uh, respondents said they had a current board approved contract. Uh, our Overall rating for customer service for the procurement team was a 3.2 out of 4 and a 3.1 out of 4 for staff responsiveness. So we were happy with the response rate um, and we were also happy with some of what they had to say about our staff as well. Um, so you can see uh, one of the one of the things that we needed to do with this, in addition to getting just some basic information about the, the vendors themselves that were responding, was understand kind of what are the roadblocks or what are some of the places where um, we need to better support vendors throughout the procurement process. So the first question you see there is a great example. It just says, are you registered with eMaryland Marketplace? We're required to use that by state law. It's where we put out our solicitations in addition to posting them on the website. If, if a vendor is registered and they've set up what they're interested in providing services for, they'll get an automatic notification every time we um, post a solicitation. So that way we don't need to know that the vendor exists to, to be able to send out separately, they can actually go and actively say, and, and these are the things that I'm interested in, please notify me. We will also send out emails to lists of vendors that we have that we know are kind of in that, cat, that, that particular category for a solicitation. But this is something that vendors can be proactively doing that where they would get that info, the information and the notification as soon as we post. Um, 
Do you check the city schools procurement website? You can see that only about a third of the people who responded see that as a, as a great way to keep up to date. And that makes sense. They don't get a notification every time we post something on the website. Email and Marketplace will do that function if they've registered. Um, are solicitation specifications accurate enough to adequately price the product or services requested? This basically means when we put out a document that says this is what we're trying to buy, is it clear enough, concise enough? Does it have enough information and explanation in order for you to be able to bid on that, to give us what we need to be able to do business with you, basically? And 62% of respondents said that that was the case. This is another indicator both for the procurement team, but also for our our offices and schools that are actually the, the, the folks that draft those specifications. And it's an indication that we need to do a little bit more uh, to support and help that process as we as we actually develop the solicitations. And that will help r remove some of the barriers for vendors to respond to procurements. Um, uh, and, uh, are our information and forms and instructions for submission of bid clear? 74% uh, said yes, 18% said no. So again, this is an indication that we're doing okay, but there's more work to do as far as getting out there and having conversations. Um, do, and does the city schools procurement website provide you with enough information? This is one where 67% of respondents said yes. Uh, and we're actually actively going through the process of updating that, that website now to address what we think are some of the gaps in the information that's available or, or maybe even adjusting the navigation so that it's easier to find things that, that vendors may be looking for. So if you could go to the next slide. We took all of this information and then we have kind of worked on a couple of different types of improvements uh, for the actual implementation and practice of policy within the department. Uh, one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing is providing updated information uh, on the website. So we've already made some tweaks in adding some columns for the Excel sheet that we post that has that information publicly available, including moving forward uh, the link to the board agenda so that you can actually click on it and find kind of back map to the uh, actual uh, approval for each of those individual items. And there's a couple of other things that we're adding as well. But what's kind of more uh, exciting is kind of what the next iteration of that will be and that's tied into the creation of this contact tracking system this is something we've been working on uh, for a, a few months now and we're in the we're in the early stages of procurement using it and some of the other uh, departments using it as well and what this system will allow us to do is be responsive to some of those basic information questions about where a contract is but it also is going to have enough of the information in it that we'll be able to automate some of the posting of information to the website as well. So we won't have to rely just on that Excel sheet as we move forward as we continue to build out that tracking system. So that's an exciting yet to come, uh, but we're, we've just actually turned on some of the components of that system this week. And so we're really excited about how that will play out as we all get kind of familiar with that and uh, build out the reporting capabilities of that both for internal stakeholders, offices, schools, and things like that, but also what that will allow us to do for better reporting for uh, community members as well. Um, we're also um, using that same thing, that same system to uh, do some more automated reporting for spending limits, board approval, and those types of things. Uh, we're in, in June and July, this should say Thursday series, we're actually starting it this Thursday. Uh, we're doing a series of meetings for vendors that kind of give some of the basic 101 of procurement. We've partnered with the communications team to actually get that out there. So this, this uh, Thursday is kind of the 101 of procurement. We're then doing a session on WMBE to help with um, help any vendors who may be interested in getting certified or just better understand the process. We're doing one on the MOU process and how you walk through all of that, um, as well as uh, the kind of the behind the scenes. I have a contract now. How do I actually invoice it and 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 um, work on all of those pieces kind of after the approval process with vendors as well. So those that series will be happening over the course of June and July. We'll be videotaping them and, and they will be, well, I shouldn't say videotaping, it's it's virtual. So it, we'll be doing kind of a webinar series that will be available on the website as well as um, materials for vendors to review, even if they aren't available for the sessions themselves. Um, we uh, have procurement office hours now. We've actually done the first one of these uh, last week where um, 
it's just an open session for it, for anyone uh, in the district. So this is offices. This this one in June was just offices. July will be offices and schools um, that have procurement questions. I can't figure out where to find a particular form. They'll be able to get help with that. If they're struggling with some invoicing issue or working something out, they'll be able to kind of drop into a standing meeting um, that will be available um, once a month and they'll be and you know ask their questions connect with the right person those types of things so we're making that available we've uh, talked about this a little bit the updating the procedure for the on hold items this is already in process making sure that the the buyers are taking the time to give enough information in the in the notes for on hold items that end users know kind of what the status of all those items is uh, reviewing and updating training materials. So all of the feedback we received from uh, the different listening sessions with the internal offices and the uh, school principals, we have gone through and reviewed um, the materials that were available. So some of it, it, we said, check the box. We have that. Some of it, we think we have pieces of it, but what we're going to be doing over the next several months is updating pieces. And we've kind of chunked that out. So there's some updates happening to some of the K-12 by materials right now. And, and we'll keep working through that until we've kind of completed all of the training materials that um, uh, offices and schools said that they were most interested in, in seeing and receiving. Um, the last thing is updating the contract monitoring form and providing guidance. Uh, contract monitoring is an important part of the process because that's where we actually ask ourselves, like, how is this vendor performing? Uh, and part of that is having the contract, uh, whoever is responsible for that contractor vendor, taking the time to review uh, the form, fill out fill out a, a basic kind of form that is almost like a performance review for the vendor uh, and providing that uh, information back to the procurement team so that we have an idea of how things are going. We can't help navigate or uh, address issues with vendors if that information isn't coming back to procurement. And one of the things that we learned through this process is that we needed to kind of spend a little bit more time explaining what that process is to um, offices and schools and then also supporting them with guidance um, and training around how to use that form and why it's important and what we'll be using it for moving forward. Uh, so with that, I think we're gonna go to the next slide, which I believe Chief Seven is gonna speak a little bit about the WMBE updates. Sure. Um, so um, as part of the policy and regulation, um, we are taking a number of steps that have been part of our process, but we also wanted to make sure that we call them out specifically. So um, we have clarified that um, our MWE program utilizes the city of Baltimore's procedures unless it is funded by um, the state's so construction, public schools construction. We've also added definitions, so they're all in one place. And um, we have included provisions that express our commitment to provide robust and dynamic outreach and engagement, um, really to support vendors to identify barriers to participation so that we're building equitable access for MWBEs. And as part of the budget related to this, we have uh, uh, added a position for a community outreach and engagement specialist focused specifically on MWBEs that will be aligned with our other equity uh, efforts. We also clarified qu criteria for goal setting and for waivers. These are the criteria we use, but it, we thought it would be helpful to put those out there and align them with other programs. And we also um, um, to put um, this very clearly out there, like it's in our contracts, but we wanted to make it clear uh, consequences for non-compliance, including liquidated damages. And I'll just emphasize also here and elsewhere a theme that Jess Wilson has been emphasizing, which is that there's really been a lot of work to align all the documents that uh, vendors receive and streamline where possible. So our contract templates and our RFPs and our uh, MWBE language and then the policy and regulation all speak harmoniously, or at least that's the goal. So uh, just a, and the last slide here is the summary of changes to the policy and the regulation. Um, they we have done quite a bit of work in that alignment area that uh, Josh just spoke about. The we have emphasized the commitment to the participation with WMBE. We've updated all that language in the regulations to better align with the updated RFP and contract template templates that we've been rolling out over the last few months. 
Um, we included a provision to allow the CFO to sign contracts and MOUs in the Director of Procurement's absence. And then we added language that aligns the procurement policy with other policies that already exist here at the, at the city schools to ensure that we are um, calling out those commitments in the procurement policy specifically. So that's equity, that's sustainability. We added living wage uh, language um, and supporting local and regional sourcing as well. Um, one of the other pieces of work we've been doing over the last few months is um, updating and strengthening our ethics and conflict of interest uh, processes and statements. And so that is also something we've updated here on the policy. And then we've clarified language to expressly allow electronic submission of bids, something that uh, was not some, something we had envisioned pre-COVID, but now we've been doing it uh, for COVID for quite some time and it ha has actually worked fairly well. And so it's something we wanted to make sure we clarified that that was part of our regulations um, should we decide to do that moving forward. So with that, if you have any questions. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, so I would love to open it up to our, our board members um, for, um, uh, some questions. Any questions from, okay, Dr. James. All right, so Jess, first, thank you. Um, this has definitely been labor of love that has been ongoing and a huge heavy lift. So you, and I know you aren't the only one that have been working on this, but under different chiefs and through different leadership, um, you really pulled it together. So thank you. Uh, also want to just uh, commend the team for for uh, really leaning into the, the equity policy and understanding that an equity policy as a standalone policy that doesn't impact others is not nearly as valuable as the as the outcome that you have shown here. So kudos, kudos to that. So um, three pieces that I just want to highlight as as places that we could enhance this policy even still and, and knowing that it's come a long way. Um, one would be within the regulations to, uh, or possibly within the policy, but I think within the regulations, to develop a vendor code of conduct. So if we're going to do business with you, here's what we expect of your organization and the, the lens on equity and emancipation and, and community engagement that you have. So whether that's some, you know, simply something that like, um, you know, we're not going to invest with people who invest in for-profit prison systems. We're not, you know, we want our vendors to have an equity policy of their own. Uh, we want those kinds of pieces. So thinking along that line as a possible enhancement to this. Um, other piece as, and I can't remember if it was Commissioner Brooks or Commissioner McFadden who said earlier, but in the conversation around making policies actualizable and lived, uh, is it possible within this policy to establish an accountability person? So we have a point person who is ultimately responsible for this. That would then give, ensure that this policy isn't something that's just on paper, uh, but is if, if someone's job performance is directly connected to the fidelity of implementation of this policy, um, would, would help ensure that it doesn't just sit as, as something in a book on a, on a shelf. Um, and then the last piece, and this piece I'll say just, you know, because, you know, dead horses still need to be beaten, apparently, um, is the idea that I've been pushing throughout the whole piece of, of, of the 1% give back, of, of some sort of a way to ensure that as we look at student outcomes and how does, how does buying sheetrock from one, you know, provider benefit more than another, how does, you know, who are electricians we're working with, how are we leveraging this policy to ensure we're getting internships or externships that the privilege of doing business with city schools is having a direct impact on our ability to leverage resources to support student experiences uh, and student outcomes and whether it's expertise within our CTE, whether it's funds that would help support early childhood or other unfunded mandates. Um, how are we, how are you using the ability the ability that we have with our incredible capital leveraging to to enhance the educational experience of young people? Great, thank you so much, Dr. James. 
Commissioner Fenton, was that you? Would you want to jump in? No. Great. Um, uh, there were just a, a, a couple of things that came to my mind. Um, uh, one of them is uh, quite similar to uh, Dr. James's point, which is around um, accountability. Um, and so uh, we're in the process of the policy uh, on the front end where we could talk about what accountability looks like, who it goes to, um, uh, if there's an issue, where does folks report something to uh, uh, and a concern. And I think that would be a great place to live in the policy and not um, uh, uh, just on the back end of that. So, um, and then um, uh, I think about the ways in which our other policies not only have that, but also the training um, component built in. Um, so like who needs to be trained, how often, with what regularity, um, to what end, um, and uh, the how doesn't need to sort of live in the policy uh, or the policy portion, but the fact that we will have them and they will um, hopefully do a thing to sort of increase people's awareness, understanding, ability to access services, et cetera. Um, and it sounds like what you all are doing with the um, the drop-in sessions would be, you know, one of the ways to do that. Um, so you don't necessarily have to say, oh, we're going to have drop-in sessions, but something that suggests that we're going to be engaging people that way. Um, and then, um, and then I so I have this uh, this wondering about the um, sort of uh, it goes to accountability around monitoring. And so, is there a way to uh, again? And when we think about accountability for this, what happens when uh, a vendor uh, does something um, or is out of compliance or something like that? Um, so I don't know if that's referenced in one of our other pieces of policy, um, but if we could just, uh, one, just name it for me, like one of it's, it's, if it's kept captured there, then I could be uh, fine with that. But I do wonder, again, like, uh, how does our vendor, like if, a, if someone who in our schools is having an issue with a vendor, like how do they get to us to report that problem or that issue or, or provide praise? And um, so I think sort of being able to capture that um, would, would be uh, great there. Um, and then I have, a, uh, I guess, one more piece, which was around, um, I know um, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Roberts um, also talks about uh, the way in which um, some of our entities, I mean, some of our schools who are doing uh, procurements, um, they might be spending 25,000, which doesn't have to come to the board, um, to get a thing, but five of the organizations, uh, five schools are getting the same thing. Um, would it be better or more strategic to sort of somehow pull out resources to get in bulk or to get a bulk or piece of that? And I'm not honestly sure if that, like, is there some way to, that lives inside of this? Um, but just wondering what is the relationship to uh, to sort of clarify a system or process for, uh, for that as well, if it needs be. Yeah, so I'm not sure. That's just an honest question on my end. Uh, how can we clarify or streamline the act, the resources of our schools who are getting the same exact service? Um, and also, I guess, how we would monitor it as well. Because if one contract, if one um, vendor is at seven schools, but they're all under $50,000, do we know that? So on that last one, I would say they uh, we do know that when the school puts in the requisition and we do track that and there are some things and I can follow up with some uh, just some basic how that works in the system. So you get an idea um, when when a vendor hits a certain threshold, they get a letter letting them know that they can only go up to fifty thousand uh, dollars. So I can provide some additional feedback for that. Uh, for the other suggestions, I think we're going to we'll take it back to the team and take a look at some of these I uh, um, ideas prior to first reader to see um, kind of what additional adjustments we might be able to make in the policy and the regulation. Great, thanks. And Commissioner McFadden, did you have any uh, thoughts? Not really, um, but thank you for checking in again. I think that um, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, visual uh, supports. Um, so at, as this policy goes through, um, I think about all of our families and the diverse needs of folks who 
you could sometimes have trouble understanding all of the information that's here, um, but they need the information. So I think of infographics um, being a way to support the way we engage our community um, with condensing the information, not necessarily dumbing it down because all of this is important, but con condensing it in a way that is digestible um, for all of our community partners to, to, to take in. That's just a thought that I had, Dr. Brooks. It's minor, but um, I think that in, in comparison to what you all were talking about, but I think that that could certainly help us as we move forward with folks really understanding um, this particular pr process called procurement. Yeah. Thank and you for that. Could live on, and it could live on, I mean, we could, use, we could send it out or, you know, I think we could better utilize um, our board. This is just broader, but I think we could better utilize our board page on the website um, for things like this when folks are having questions or thoughts about um, policies, one like this, but in a infographic way. It's a suggestion, right? I, I know it's a stretch, but it's a suggestion. Great, thank you so much um, uh, for the presentation. And I know at least one public comment would be referencing sort of the procurement policy for sure. Um, and so uh, hoping folks are staying on uh, the line uh, as we uh, hear from our uh, our community members. Um, Christian, uh, who's who's up um, first for our uh, first? Ms. Melissa Schober. Okay. Yep. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, good afternoon, members of the Board Policy Committee. My name is Melissa Schober, and I'm a member of the Parent and Community Advisory Board. At the outset, we wish to thank Jessica Wilson for meeting with PCAB, hearing our procurement-related concerns, and answering our questions. As this committee considers revisions to policy DJA, we wish to call attention to a few areas of particular concern. First, Subsection B under purpose has been updated to include a reference to policy ADA on equity and calls upon staff to quote, ensure that purchasing and procurement practices provide access and economic opportunities within communities represented by students of color. We welcome this addition, but respectfully request that the policy or accompanying regulation specify how the district intends to ensure this access and how the assurance will be shared with parents, caregivers, students, and the community at large. We would like to know how the policy committee intends to enforce this as it seems in tension with the current fair student funding formula. As this body is well aware, when enrollment at a school declines, the school receives fewer dollars and is less able to procure goods and services. With the withdrawal or truncation of programs, for example, canceling music lessons or reducing social emotional learning activities, more families leave the school, which leads to even more funding loss. How this committee intends to monitor this policy in light of current funding practices is critical. We look forward to further edits that further specify equity related monitoring oversight, particularly in light of the fair student funding formula. Second, transparency. We appreciate the improvements to the procurement spreadsheet posted online, but, thinks this but think this revision represents an opportunity for further enhancements. In particular, we respectfully request that every future procurement considered by the board should list clearly the vendor, amount, contract monitor, and school and grades in which the vendor will operate. We understand that the school and grades may not be known at the time of procurement, but that information should be added as expeditiously to the publicly available data as possible, and such transparency should be guaranteed in the policy or administrative regulation. Finally, ethics. Policy BCA, which governs this body, notes that the board's and city school's ethical commitment is rooted in, quote, fairness, equity, and integrity. To that end, we would respectfully request that the policy or administrative regulation detail instances in which it is permissible for staff to request current or past vendors to testify favorably before the board during public comment. We are aware that staff requested at least two vendors speak favorably at a recent board meeting on policy FCE. 
We would like clarity about the relationship between staff and current vendors, including whether it is indeed permissible for staff that design and oversee solicitations to request actions from vendors that fall outside the scope of work in the contract and how doing so might influence or favor that vendor in future procurements. We thank you for your consideration and time. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Rebecca Yenwan, and I see she is um, logged in. Hi, Rebecca, you're still muted. Okay, great. Sorry, my screen froze for a moment. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to echo some of Melissa Schober's comments um, and, and asking for some increased transparency in the procurement policy. Um, as she mentioned in a recent board meeting, we experienced a handful of community partners testifying in support of a policy which affirmed their role in city schools. At least three of these community partners had contracts with the district and lending their support is biased by the financial benefit they receive from their partnership. We ask procurement policy include a practice of vendors disclosing their partnership status and the amount that their organization is paid by the district before they testify at a school board meeting. We believe it is unethical to have those who benefit financially from supporting the district, filling up spots for public testimony and having influence on policy if in fact they are not representative of the public. As one of the few organizations that represents families of city school students, we believe public testimony should be for those who do not already have a voice or a privileged status within the school system. This proposed disclosure would be one step towards increased equity in the testimony process. We thank you so much for your concern. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, and so um, uh, we have uh, we have some time and so I'm just um, really um, interested in understanding a little bit more about um, sort of uh, what happened in terms of like the um, the staff uh, sort of requesting supports uh, from the vendors. So if anyone on staff can speak to that or sort of like what happened in that process, that would be really, really helpful for me. Do we have a, a comment on that? I don't know if that's um, uh, uh, Chief Perkins, uh, Cohen's or, or someone else or like. So I believe it's referring to um, a public session earlier where some um, members of the public spoke in favor of the engagement policy. Um, and uh, like Teachers Democracy Policy Project, there are and there are entities who also have other relationships with um, with the school board who um, who spoke after being you know engaged in the policy. They um, they uh, were. Um, you know, just like as many partners do, they reach out to make sure that there are people who who speak up about something. Um, there were people who um, came to speak in favor of the engagement that they um, were very positive about, that we heard back from them. I mean, often when we do engagement, we hear back from people that they're very appreciative of the of the way we've engaged them. And so, um, you know, I think, I, I don't know the specifics of it, but I believe in some cases, then the question was, well, you know, if you thought it was a positive process, can you come speak? Just like people can come speak about anything. So many people who speak at the board, um, you know, do have, that's why they're engaged in the community. They have relationships in different ways. They work with a charter operator, they work with a vendor, they work in different ways, they work with a teacher's democracy po uh, project. There's different ways that people um, are connected to the community. Those who really care about city schools often do have some type of relationship with the school system. So I think it's not exactly accurate to say that that's why they were speaking. They were speaking because they were engaged in a policy that they had, uh, their, their were, their input was solicited on um, because again, we try to engage partners, um, community partners, partners who work with the school district, employees, all manners of the school community to give input on a policy when it's um, before the board or or anything that we're working on when it's before the board. Mm. Thank you. Um, so Rebecca or Melissa, did you have any uh, thoughts or sort of reflections from what um, uh, Chief Perkins shared? Um, we have some free time, so you know, uh, we can have a little bit more free flowing of a conversation uh, in this space. And it's um, less rigid. I, so I, I appreciate it. And so within the 
bounds of what PCAB has discussed since I'm here representing them and not my own personal views. Um, we wanted transparency because we were concerned about the impact of a vendor relationship and the fiscal responsibility therein. So we recognize and affirm that members of the community are employed by city schools and vendors, and we have no wish to um, prevent those individuals from speaking. But if they are solicited by staff to speak, and there is a fiscal relationship with a current contract, as there was, for example, with code in the schools, we would like that to be disclosed or a consideration for the ethical nature of that contact, given that staff are reaching out to someone who has a current contract with roles and responsibilities specified therein. And if a vendor is approached by the person or an employee of the organization that is overseeing them to do something like speak to the board, um, could that not influence future procurement? Um, and would that not be a consideration for fairness and equity in considering potential vendors or contract renewals in the future? I hope that's clear. Okay, that's helpful for me. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah. So again, I think it would just be a little bit of a mischaracterization to say that they were solicited. I mean, I think there was, again, f folks who were a part of you know, again, as a matter of public interest, we always try to engage a range of partners, whether they're vendors, whether they're community partners, whether they're staff, uh, whether they're parents, whether they're students in um, in policies. And so, um, yes, sometimes those folks we hear from um, have uh, positive, you know, have positive engagement around something. And so checking in with them to see, well, then would you want to testify to that is you know, part of hearing from the public. And so I know, you know, um, that is, a, you know, that's something we want to do is make sure we're hearing from a range of voices. So uh, we, we hear from a range of voices in public comment people, anybody has a right to sign up for public comment. So, and it was not in the capacity and it's not the person who supervised um, code in the schools who who was in, would talk to them. So I just think it's a little bit of a misrepresentation of, of the conversation. Yeah, so um, I think Melissa oh. probably said it better than I, I could, but I, I do believe that if someone is asked to testify in support of a policy and they are also a contractor who benefits from their relationship with the district, that that uh, potential for bias should at least be ex exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. So, so for me, the, that's what I was trying to get a little bit uh, clear about sort of what's understanding sort of like um, who, what is classified as the public, right? So if, if someone has an active contract with us, uh, does the illusion of inviting someone to speak, um, I don't, I just have not engaged this, this idea. So uh, uh, does that give the, the image of uh, sort of trying to sway someone on, in our favor for, for doing that? And I don't know. Um, but I do think it's worthy of a discussion around sort of uh, with the board um, around sort of what happens when we invite other folks into a space uh, that we have actual contracts with to give public testimony. Are they really public? Uh, are they um, uh, or does is there some other classification for them uh, for us to consider as as we hear from 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 other folks, uh, particularly from uh, when, when that might sort of be at the expense of, of, of other community partners or other community members. And so I don't know, I don't have an answer there, but I, I just, I do think that that's, those are really great questions for us to grapple with, um, uh, especially the, the piece of whether or not a staff is soliciting um, of that. And so I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't um, got a brief, but we can follow up with that. Um, uh, in an exec session too, because I, I do think it it is worthy to be discussed uh, um, uh, sort of in in the space. And so, um, thank you, uh, Commissioner McFadden or uh, Commissioner James. Did you all have thoughts or reactions? Or um, great. Um, so hopefully we can sort of pick this up in exec session to figure out, uh, learn a little bit more about what um, actually happened and sort of what does it mean um, for sort of transparency and trust in the district. Um, and, uh, and our relationships with community members and community partners. Um, so yeah, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief Perkins, for chiming in and sort of contextualizing and giving us some some feedback, uh, which I was 
uh, less privy to. Um, so thank you. Great, and thank you so much for um, our community partners coming um, uh, into sort of uh, the space and uh, sharing thoughts, feedback uh, on our, our policies and sort of the, its impact on, on all of us. And so I uh, just wanna thank you there. Um, if there are no other questions about sort of the, the things that we've discussed today, I will sort of um, begin to wrap us. Uh, Christian, did we miss anything um, before we uh, close? No, we didn't, just uh, next meeting which will be June, July 20th, but yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much. And so um, as we begin to, to sort of close out, just wanna say um, again, um, thank you so much for, for our folks being here. Uh, as you all know, this is a public uh, meeting um, and we invite people to come uh, and to sort of be with us uh, during this time and to share their uh, perspective as well. Um, our next meeting is uh, uh, Christian suggested uh, is July 20th. Um, it's uh, 3.30 to 5.30, it's still a virtual meeting. That meeting will be um, exploring uh, policy EBCD uh, delayed openings and emergency closings, uh, as well as policies impacted by the COVID-19 uh, and 19, uh, pandemic and our recovery. Um, of course,